So and we don't have to maintain that. So that's a good point. It has other bad points also. So everybody probably will say if they want or not to use Git, I let you to choose that. Uh, so two years after the first version of Iceberg, uh, the first presentation of Iceberg was in ISO in Prague uh, with Nico. So one of the things that we learned in the two last years is that Git is a misunderstood monster. So yeah, he's fluffy like that, he's complex. Uh, it has bad things also, but uh, I don't know, people is just scared of it. So people should um, sometimes think, uh, try to learn a bit more, not just the fatalities of the command line, uh, and see that actually there's a fluffy monster, I said. Uh, but the thing that we, we saw is that uh, people not only know, uh, so people doesn't know it. And that we realized when making iceberg. So the, first, the previous UI, actually this is the third iteration on the UI, and the first two iterations were kind of complex, sometimes a bit uh, uh, dark, so I don't know, people didn't understand the metaphors behind, and also because they didn't understand it. it actually, sometimes it happens right now that people try to pull the, the, pull, pull, the pull button and think that that will install code, code in your system. Uh, no, that's not like that. So um, we have to uh, we have to better uh, explain it. That's something that we have to fix. But we have to understand that uh, one of the problems of why we we are iterating on iceberg many many times is because uh, it's complicated and we have to make it better. So the other thing is that iceberg grew up. So right now, actually, we are in the version 1.2.2. We, in November it was 0 0.6.8 or something like that. Uh, and we chose to, uh, to pass on the 1.0 because it was kind of stable at some point and now we are using semantic version for real. So, uh, so that means that there were two patch versions and two uh, feature adding versions and so on. Uh, but that also has some repercussions. So I will speak a bit more about that. So, I did a good point. Okay, so in this last month, actually there were much things going on, so I don't want to actually bother you about that. So there were things in SSH, we have worked on our Git file system to be able to debug better the, um, the iceberg, actually. So we had tab support, three-way merge, new working copy, 64 bit metachain integration. So we were working on a lot of things. Uh, but I, will, I want to talk uh, only about four things today. So, First, the new UI. Second, uh, how do we get actually more robust? How do we feel safer about our own code? Um, then, two things that are about the internal design of Iceberg. Uh, actually, when discussing with Dave, it was funny because uh, uh, we arrived from different, completely different paths to some similar solutions in Iceberg and in Toad. So it's fun to actually uh, see that I don't know, uh, we are right to the same solution and we think that that is the way to go, so uh, we are not crazy. Uh, so, the two points that uh, I would like to explain a bit uh, about the design, the internal things that we changed, is the dual working copy and the three-way merge. So, let's start with the new UI and the metaphors behind it. So, the first thing is that the new UI is spec-based. The idea is that, okay, uh, we were having some problems with the previous mm -hmm. UI, we decided to do, we were mixing spec and glamour, we decided to go just for spec and to create some reusable widgets and one of the things that we are going to try to reuse the metaphors of this UI in other kind of tools like the launcher for example uh, so that is why we are trying to get a more mature spec I know that spec is not super super nice to use sometimes uh, but we are getting actually a better spec for that um, but Okay, so the, and also the thing that moving to spec uh, should in the long term allow us to migrate more, much more easily to block, brick, and that kind of stuff. So, uh, and not depending just on morphs. Uh, so that is the choose of the technology. So what are the three guidelines, the three things that we, we wanted to do in the new UI? So we wanted to be explicit, we wanted to be explicit, and we wanted to be explicit. Um, what do I mean? So I already talked about that yesterday. So one of the things that we want to preview our destructive operations. We don't want people to destroy their own code uh, without knowing it. So I, if I'm going to pull code into your image, 
I'm going to tell you before, and you will tell me, yes, uh, I want to delete that class. Otherwise, I am not going to do it. Um, we want to warn about problematic states. So if somebody saw the um, the red status in the project, so I, I will show some screenshots afterwards. Uh, you on the repair buttons. If you check the repair buttons, that's what I mean with that. And the other thing that we want to try to let the user decide uh, in most places, so we gave options. Sometimes when we give the options, we try to teach also the user about things. Because the, I think that we need to uh, get much better so as a community in all this. And if we teach people how to use Git and what are the problems and the advantages of one or, or another solution, I think we all can have much better discussion tools. So, uh, the first thing. So you will see, uh, uh, for example, in the commit view, I don't know if you... I remember when using Monticello, actually one of the things... I am using Iceberg for every and each one of my projects right now. So if Iceberg breaks, I cannot work. So that is why I can say, okay, it works. Because I am using it all the time. Um, so one of the things that bothered me a lot of Monticello, it was, it was that actually when I wanted to commit, I had to manually click on the changes button to see what I was going to commit before. So, no, show me what I am going to commit at the same time I am committing so I can choose what is the commit message that I want to use. So, this is a really stupid thing. And actually, a kind of uh, UI like this was already there in Iceberg uh, since one or two years. Uh, but we have taken this metaphor to all the other UIs also. So, that is. Okay, you want to commit. I will show you what you are committing, so you can choose what is your message. And I am telling you, I am going to tell you also where are you going to commit in which branch. And you can, okay, the cherry picking is just uh, an extra feature. Uh, and the diff, showing the diff, that's good. So, um, the same thing happens with the pool. Actually, when you are going to pool, uh, we are showing you what are the commits that you are pulling. Uh, you can check the diffs. There are two diffs in there that we uh, show you what is the difference between the current commit and the commit that is selected and the commit that is selected and is parent. So you can check actually what are the changes that you are importing in your image. Uh, so the same thing happens with the checkout. Actually every time that you, you check out something into the image. So one of the things we are going to check, tell you what are you going to check out, what, what is the branch or the commit issue that you are going to check out. We are going to tell you what, uh, what are the effects that will happen in your machine. So, are you, go, uh, are you going to lose some changes? Are you going to lose uh, some code? So, that's it. Um, the other thing is that every time that right now, we are showing uh, the repository status. So, the, uh, I think it was like that before, but we have added a lot more new repository status. And there are some that are red. So, actually, it happens that sometimes that we, you will go ahead into a detached working copy state. I will explain that afterwards. That, I think in Toad it's called, well, so there is another day. Uh, so that in, in Toad it was called a version of skew, I think, or I don't know. Uh, but that means that your image is not synchronized with your repository. And that is a problematic state. I will go in there. But the thing is that when you are in, in this kind of situations, we are going to propose you uh, through the repair repository button or the menu, the context menu, uh, we are going to propose you several solutions. So in this form, which is what we call the repair actions. So when you see one of these things, please read it. So the repair, the repair actions actually will first tell you what is the problem, why are you there? So the, that, the, that is the thing on top of the list. So why did you arrive to this situation where your repository is ready? Then you have some options. Uh, we have some model there to allow us to decide which options are available for each state and so on. So we can add more or less. Uh, so if you want to add stuff in here, we can. Um, so and every for each one of the solutions that we propose, below, if you select one, we are going to tell you what are the uh, effects that that will have in your code. So we, for example, if you want to discard local changes and check out an existing branch, that will discard all your changes in your image. So if, if you have a dirty working copy, that will discard all your changes, all the changes that you did, and it will load all the code, the code that you selected into the image. So, and it will tell you, for example, if you will be able to recover your code or not, and so on. Um, 
So read this one. The, <coughs> this one is uh, if you find it in using it. So that is kind of all I wanted to say about the new UI. So we are trying to be explicit. It is not perfect. I will not promise that it will be a perfect UI, but we are doing our best. And if you find cases that can be cancer, just throw at us, uh, open an issue, we eat issues. So uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about is our uh, new, uh, the process that we have developed in the last six months. So one of the things that we are right now, so I cannot work if I don't have a CI. I don't know, I, I am kind of addicted to a CI. Even for little projects right now, if I don't have a CI, I really feel bad about it. So we are trying to automate most of it. Uh, so the middle, the crunch in the middle is power. So we are getting a lot of power using this kind of tool. So, and we are gaining a lot of time also, because all, the more that we automate things, the less time I have to pass around and trying to test stuff manually in my machine. Uh, and I can concentrate on other stuff. So, uh, as well as getting big. This is not big, actually. So uh, we have 70 packages, five, 600 classes, uh, 20,000 lines of, of code. So that is not big. Yes, we can all agree on that. But for my case, that is more code that a single person can manage uh, without tests. Let's say, let's say it like that. So uh, actually, we are. I will go over that afterwards, but. Um, I, uh, I don't feel actually comfortable with this amount of code that, that actually is really few um, if, I, if I don't have any tests or any automated uh, way of saying that I didn't break anything. So, uh, actually in the last six months we augmented the code coverage from around 6% to f more than 53%. And actually I think it is more because while running the code coverage the, I found the bug in the test runner. So I, I didn't think it executed all the code. Um, but so I can that is the number that the code coverage to so I can only trust it. So but that gives us at least some kind of uh, I don't know, I, I touch some code, I, I say okay, I will try this for factor. Because we build a lot of prototypes uh, and we say, yeah, okay, let's try what happens if we do this? So we just try, then we are testing it manually for so we are playing with the application maybe for one, two weeks, and then but if you don't I don't have the tests. Then it happens that Esteban said, says, ah, you broke something. Uh, I, if, you, if there is no test, actually it doesn't exist. So I cannot, <laughs> I cannot ensure that I, I am not breaking or uh, breaking or not breaking anything if there is no test. So that is why I actually, I really push in writing tests for everything. So we are trying to also get tests in the UI that test the, the, not only the UI models, but also the UI. So um, that is because I feel better. <laughs> About that. So, because of that, also we have uh, put a lot of effort in writing tests. So, as part of Iceberg, we have written uh, it was mainly Pablo, so, um, a library for managing parameters, parameterizable, parameterized test. That will be better. Um, so, that we have extracted into this repository for usage. So, it, you can actually configure a test case with a matrix, and you can then it runs all the combinations. So that is really useful for this stuff. Because we have a lot of scenarios that we want to run the same test. You want to check that if you commit and then you make a diff, that you have the right diff for a lot of different scenarios, with merges, without merges. Uh, that is the first commit in the repository. Uh, that, uh, so there are a lot of things. So this actually really simplifies our life. Uh, but the thing with that is that the amount of tests just grows exponentially. So uh, every time that we have the new test, we have much more tests and they take much more time to run. Yes? Just to, to give an idea of what Gisha says on the combination, if you add one single test in a, in a suite of tests where we uh, test the integration with Metachello, it spawns 90 different tests. In, uh, in a week, with uh, using the, the math matrix, we went from... Uh, I think we were on 600. Uh, yes. 600 tests and we doubled the amount of tests in one week. Uh, but with a lot of different scenarios, and we found a lot of bugs. Uh, but the thing is that the more tests you have, the more time they take to run also. So at some point, actually, in February, I remember uh, that one of the... So I, I started to work on Esper on November. <coughs> in February, all the, running all the tests, it was taking around uh, five minutes. So I, said I couldn't bear it anymore. 
and running it in your machine and actually, yeah, gone. So in the CI, it's okay, you just push your changes and you, you, you wait, but sometimes that's not enough when you want to debug it. So the, we also try to work on how to speed up the thing. So one of the things that we did for that is, for example, we first, when you have performance problems, one of the first things that you do is to measure where the problem is. Yeah. So we saw that we had a lot of slowdowns because actually every time that we were pulling code or checking out code, creating classes and creating methods, that was impacting the system. And impacting the system means we are creating events, we are updating all the UI, uh, all the IDE, we are actually also uh, adding new entries in the source code files and so on. So that takes a lot of time. Uh, all four, just uh, running a couple of tests that we are, uh, and all those classes that we are going to remove them. So actually we have created a backend for Iceberg that uses Ring just for testing, so it's kind of, uh, we are using it as mocks mainly. Uh, but actually that let us move the, from five minutes to a couple of seconds uh, in February. So now actually, uh, maybe I can show it afterwards. So uh, actually just running the unitary test, it takes five minutes in the CI. So just the unit test. We have the integration test and other stuff. Uh, but otherwise it, it wouldn't have been possible. I don't know where the five minutes would be right now. So, uh, thanks for <laughs> Uh, so we have invested a lot on, CA, on the CI. So we have around 18 jobs uh, that run the test in multiple platforms, so in Windows OS 6, 6, 6, 7. Uh, Windows is working. It's failing, but it's good because it's running the test in part 6, not in part 7. Okay, so with Windows we're not yet there, um, but it's on the way. We are using a paper for those that are interested. So, also we have some jobs that not only run tests, that we also run some, auto, we are also automatize some tasks, like for example, um, we are synchronization the wiki, now the wiki, so if somebody knows the git, the github wiki, the github wiki is a git repository, but it's, you cannot do pull requests on the github wiki. So actually what we do is we store the documentation in the documentation folder in the repository so people can do pull requests and then we have the process that will uh, automatically push this, the new stuff from the main repository into the wiki. Um, so we have a lot of tests for meta chain integration. We have a test that tests that, the, that we can integrate the latest version of Iceberg into the latest version of Faro just to test if we are ready for a new integration, for example those. So, and for all that, we are using Smart um, And this, all this, it takes time, but I, don't, I cannot imagine how much time I, it would be just to do it all this manually also. So, um, so, one of the other things that we have been done for getting a more robust thing is that now we make sure that we run in 64 bits, so uh, it's in the matrix, in the jobs. So for that, actually, we had to make sure that we have OS process running in 64 bits, so we have been actually making it a bit stable. There were not so many changes to do on it, but uh, so since mid-May, actually, the version, we have a really stable version of uh, OS process. Right now, we have the release 1.0.1, so OS process was mainly developed by Mariano Beck. Um, we have been iterating on it a bit, but just to make it more Robust. Um, so, just uh, as a summary, what are our key points for this? So, I, I hate fearing change. So, I don't like to fear change. So, uh, if I want to try a change, I, I want to not fear it. So, uh, for that, actually, we have a lot of tests. Yes, we have in, in a lot of platforms. And we automate them so I don't have to run them manually. So, uh, I run them, of course, but just in case, I want that every pull request. So that is why we almost never push directly to Iceberg, even if it is myself, Pablo, Esteban, we make pull request. Just to make the CI run the test. It's free. So, at least for us. Um, and we are enhancing our infrastructure. Uh, so we are working not only in Iceberg, so also in the surrounding stuff. So that is the, these main two points, which are kind of uh, cross-cutting. So I would like to talk now about two 
different things that are actually a bit controversial that people may ask questions about. So the first thing is that the dual working copy. So uh, the working copy we talked yesterday about it in Git is where your files are. Yeah. So it's where, when you check out the branch, Git will put in your working copy a copy of the files that correspond to that branch. So in Iceberg, actually, we have another working copy. So we call that the in image working copy. And that working copy remembers the commits that was installed in the image. So when you load code in your image, we are remembering that. Why? Because that simplifies all the whole process of making divs, of actually uh, pulling, pushing, making an emerge. Uh, so and the thing is that this is uh, so actually not having that. Before we had a, we had a much more complicated version of that, where actually it remembered a commit per package, and it was trying to guess uh, in which version you are. So this version is much simpler. And actually, I tried it, and why we are talking about December, uh, and I say fuck, it works. So, uh, but it has a couple of uh, things, a couple of problems. So not not problems per se, but so the thing is that. We have a working copy in the image that remembers the commit that is installed in the image, and we have a working copy in Git. So the thing is that the happy way, the happy thing, uh, so the happy scenario is if the commit that is in the image and the commit in the repository, so head actually that is head, uh, are the same. So that is the really happy scenario. Why? Because that means that all your repository is, in, uh, is really synchronized, and that means that you can work much more easily. So it creates a lot of less problems. So the problem with this is when you get desynchronized. So what happens if you had your image, you were working on it, you loaded code on it, um, but then you saved your image, you closed it, and then you went to the repository in the disk on the command line and you started touching it. You changed brand, your branch, you started committing, you measured something, I don't know. But now the working copy in Git head actually points to a different commit than your image. So you open your image, and actually Iceberg will tell you you're in the touch of working code. So um, the thing with this is that we cannot guess. So we cannot guess if the two commits are actually compatible or not, or if actually you did that by mistake or not. So that is why actually we are warning you, and we are telling you, wait, you are, you are the touch. So uh, be careful. So the, why usually this happens? So there are many possibilities. If somebody is just uh, working from far off from the image, actually it should not happen. So one thing that uh, may lead you to this is because you touch the Git repository from outside the image. So okay, uh, that happens. For example, if you wanted to add some external files, so pictures, HTML files. Um, if your image crashed in between commits, so you committed, uh, then you, uh, so you save your image, you commit, and then your image crashes. So actually, um, since you committed after the save, uh, the image that was saved was remembering another commit, and not the latest commit. So uh, this should not happen because Faro should not crash. Uh, but uh, <coughs> if we are, you are in the bleeding edge, like some, some of us that are running the latest, latest VM just to check that it works, uh, it may happen, and then you will find yourself that iceberg gracefully says, tells you, ah, you are detached, so ha, recover this, please. Um, and another thing could be that actually you forgot to save your image after commit, so you commit, and then you just quit without saving. So that means that the image that was saved, again, was remembering another commit. So if you are in any of these scenarios, actually... Sorry, yeah. Yes? In the third option, you don't get the detached working copy every time, though. Can happen. Or you say that if, you, if you commit but you don't save, then that means that the, when you open again your image, your, your image will remember an older commit. So that is a detached working copy. And if it's not, uh, it's a problem. It's, it's, for you, it's, it's a problematic situation. So probably there are more graceful ways to. So uh, wait, how do I get out of the detached working copy first? So, and then we can discuss about more graceful solutions for this, but if we don't have the basic uh, way to manage the, this scenario, then we cannot think about more complicated stuff. So, 
One way to do that is to actually tell the Git repository, ah, wait, my image is in this commit that maybe it's older, so I want to start the branch from there. So that actually, it, that means to move, you change your repository, but not your image. So uh, you tell the repository, yeah, actually, I, I was working on this commit, so please go back to that commit. So just, you just create the branch, you check out that branch, and that's all. The other option is to move the, actually, that was option two. The option one actually is to move your image to the state of the repository. So the repository has new stuff, the thing, things that you committed before, but actually since you didn't save your image, so your image has old code. So actually one way to do that is to load the code in the image. So you load the code that is into the repository and that is like moving the, the image to the same state as the repository. So actually the thing is that you have to synchronize both, so basically. And the option three that is the most complicated is try merging both commits. In the habit scenario, you would have a fast forward world, uh, but I, if you were changing branches and doing strange stuff, I cannot really guarantee that it will be fast forward and probably you will have conflict. So, you can try it. Yes? Branch? What? It doesn't remember the branch. You save your image or not? <laughs> I did a commit. You, yes. Yes. Then I made changes. Yes. I saved my image. Yes. Then I cloned uh, the repo from another location, which does not have this commit. So Iceberg will remember that. But then he will tell you that you are detached. Never. Iceberg will tell. Iceberg will remember that. But then, if you try to. Uh, use another repository that ha doesn't have that commit, actually Iceberg will, Iceberg will tell you that, that, that the commit that you are on in the image is not in the repository, you cannot find it. So actually that's another kind of error that is not... Uh, so you, uh, Iceberg will propose you to fetch in that case, because he said, ah, I don't have this commit, where is it? Uh, I have to try to get it from somewhere. Uh, that might not work because actually the commit was only in your local machine and maybe you removed that. So in that case, uh, actually you are dead. You have, you have to discard your commit and try to check out another. Maybe, maybe if you need a backup, <laughs> then you can recover. See, <laughs> okay. sí, yeah. So, uh, in the new iceberg we have a simpler design. So we simplify the model uh, by a lot, uh, since iceberg is uh, that really to, to me it's less error prone because it's simpler um, but we still we are looking for the workflow simplification like maybe you can discuss with me if you want so I, I don't know, I am thinking what happens if we remember the branch also maybe we have some kind of virtual branch maybe we can actually remove some of the complicated scenarios make them more easy to, to solve and so on um, so the fourth thing actually is that uh, one of the things that uh, that I was listening in the previous version of Iceberg is that nobody was actually trusting the merge. Yeah? So actually that's because the merge didn't work. No, <laughs> <laughs> no but really, actually we, we spent uh, now, I don't know how much time we probably were making scenarios on the whiteboard trying to cover all the possible scenarios that might happen. Um, so we have to re implement a new merge algorithm for that. Um, so the things that uh, we have a solution, so Iceberg is a repository, is a repository project based, let's say. Um, so, repository project. so, yeah, so the algorithm that we had before, actually, he didn't try to merge the whole repository, he tried to merge package per package using the Monticello merge. So, that was complicating a bit the things. Uh, now, we actually, we are merging the full thing together, so you have only one single merge, even if you have 500 packages, before you had 500 merges. So, um, that is much more simpler and easier to use. Uh, we also allow file merges, so if you change the file between two branches, Iceberg will show you that, and will, if you have a conflict between changes in external files, Iceberg will allow you at least to choose, do you want the left or the right one, and then it will just work. And it also honors the git merge semantics, so it honors uh, fast forward one, non fast forward one, and so on. And it's a three way merge. Yeah. So, who knows what the three way merge is? Two, three, third. So, a three way merge. I will explain because it's interesting. 
Um, so usually when you are in this scenario where you have multiple branches and you want, for example, you are in master and you want to merge development into into master, uh, you can actually take the contents of uh, the commit on, on development and the contents on, of the commit in master and try to merge them as text. Yeah, but you are kind of losing the semantics of that. For example, let's say that uh, in master you changed a class. Yeah, uh, I added an instance variable to the class, and then in development I removed the same class. In a completely different branch, I, uh, I did something completely different and actually something conflicting. So the the thing is that in what you did in, in one side was to did a, you did a modification or something, and on the other side you removed something. So actually, when you try to merge those, the correct thing would be to tell you, wait, what happened here? Do I remove the class or do I modify the class? I don't know what to do. So to be able to calculate that, you have not only to compare the commit in development against the commit in master, but you also you also have to compare both commits against the common the common part. Because that is the only way that, uh, to know that the, the, a class was removed or modified uh, in comparison to the other. So actually, I, will, I have a little picture. So let's imagine that the blue trees are the contents of each commit. Yeah? So we have the T1 is the contents of the commit on the left, the T2 is the, one, the contents of the commit on the right, and T3 is the contents of the commit of the common part. Yeah? So, if I do a difference between T1 and T3, that will give me the difference of the left branch. So that will tell me, ah, here you changed the class. And if you do the difference between T2 and T3, you have the, dif uh, the difference of the right branch. So if you will tell me, ah, you removed the class. If you take the two different trees and you merge them together, then you can calculate conflicts, for example. You can say, ah, wait, here actually I don't know what to do, so I will ask the user. I have a conflict, do you want to remove or do you want to uh, modify just like this? So that is what we call the merge tree. So it's calculated like that. And so this is our algorithm, it's nothing really magical. But just a question. Yes. Uh, the algorithm, in case in the conflict, I can try to make changes to perform the merge or have to choose one? Uh, we don't have UI support for that, but we would like to. <laughs> so. Actually, we are reusing the thing that we re-implemented the algorithm, but um, we are still reusing some old UI from Monticello that didn't support that. So okay, uh, and the, it's not the parent, but the common ancestor. The common ancestor, the common parent. Yeah, it's a common ancestor. So actually, that, that, can, that can, can be more complicated. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but that is a problem that we have. That still we have many features that are in the model and that supported, but we have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we pass a lot of time actually prototyping UIs and try to say, ah, does this work or not? No, it's ugly, so no, we don't do it. So, so the thing that, okay, we have that algorithm, and actually we have just trees, we have an implementation of trees, and we, we can merge and make differences between trees and stuff like that. So actually, that is what you see when you see a checkout or a merge tree. We are just showing you the tree. Uh, because we have the objects, we will show you stuff, uh, nothing complicated. So, uh, the thing is that, okay, we work on having a reliable merge. The idea is that this simply, I, okay, I will not tell 100%, but 97.6% sure that you will not lose code. <laughs> and that, it, that I am sure that it will correctly calculate conflicts, but still we need some UI concerns uh, to do it. Right. So those are those were more for uh, my four points. Um, what are the possible evolution paths? Uh, so we were thinking that so two different things to do maybe. So one is to manage more than code. For example, we would like to be able from from for Excel from iceberg to commit an HTML file to detect ah yeah you change that HTML file from the uh, from, from in the disk. So okay, do you want to commit it from iceberg or not? Um, the other thing is to manage two projects. That is mostly useful for Iceberg. Of people wanting to have more than one project in the same repository, uh, Faro is the 
is a case where actually we are overusing that. So we have a lot of projects in Faro that right now we are managing it as a flat thing, and we would like to split it to just make it easier to manage. Um, so we don't know what we are going to do next. But these are two things that we were thinking on. So these are big things that we, are, we were working on, we were thinking on. Uh, if you have any ideas, we are listening. Uh, so that's all that I have to say. So kind of that is the story of this year of Iceberg. Thank you. Questions? So, uh, we were evaluating actually sub modules, sub trees, sub repos. We were reading not only their, um, their specifications, also their implementations. Uh, actually, the, right now, Iceberg uses as backend libgit. Libgit only has support for sub modules. The other two implementations of sub repos and sub. Uh, what is the third one? I don't know. So, the, one that is, the, the other two that are not sub modules. Uh, they are implemented completely in Bash. So if we want to support something like that, that means that we have to replicate the entire implementation in Faro. So, and uh, still, uh, we were looking at them and we are not actually happy with what they do. So the question is, we don't know what to do there actually. So uh, do we actually support one of those or do we implement something in house that solves our problems better, but then we are losing some, maybe some compatibility with the command line. Uh, so th there's no perfect solution and we don't know yet what to do there. But uh, we uh, were really, really thinking about it. Yes? Uh, I don't know, but it's possible that uh, you can, a user can add some kind of copy of resolution policy? Or Not yet, but... This could be a good idea because maybe I want to... I, have some form to resolve my conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, if I uh, actually, so far, actually, what you can do in the when you're merging, you can do right click and say, okay, I want to take all uh, yeah. all that all the incoming. I, I think in, in automatically you do that. Uh, I don't. No. Yeah, it's dual. Because, yes, it's dual yeah, because I actually it's just a tree. So yes. the, the, what we have is just a tree, and in a tree we have either. Uh, some piece of, of class or method that is already resolved or a conflict. So you can do a visitor on the tree and say, yeah, I'll do this. And so it's doable. Then how to plug it and what are the possible strategies that you could imagine? I don't know. You have them in your head, so... Yeah, yeah. We can talk <laughs> yes. about that. So, Norbert. Um, yeah, the most interesting thing for me is if there's documentation about the scripting, because everything is there in the model, so you can do your own git scripts for workflow stuff. Yes, so in Faro, you mean? Yeah. Yes, so the API is pretty stable right now. Actually... Documentation, what's Sorry? Documentation about that. Yes, yes, yes. So actually, we were not documenting it on purpose right now. So until now, because we, were, we wanted it to be really stable. So once you, we start documenting it, it means that it will be more complicated to change. But yes, we are going to do it. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, why is it the case that like, for uh, Marshall folders? In one so folder? Yeah, so I cannot have like multiple folders because Firefox is multiple device, so I don't always have like my folder multiple folders. So, the problem of the single folder multiple folders. But I don't understand. So, the Python thing is something different. So, so far, actually, yes, we are forcing everybody to just use one single folder per repository. We are not so happy with it. Uh, before, actually, it was kind of the same. The only thing is that you could choose the repository when, when you were cloned. So you can say, yeah, I want to actually. But you could only manage one, uh, one source folder at a time, even in that case. So uh, what we want to, that is part of what I was talking about sub projects. The question is how to support them well. Also, we were prototyping before going to vacations, I don't know, in June with Pablo. So actually, how to show the entire three of files in the, in the working copy. So for, uh, not just the, 
so this is an idea that Norbert said, yeah, we can show the entire thing and then let's try to, uh, to detect which are the folders that have far packages and so on. Um, so we started prototyping on it, but still it needs work. We, it's not something that we can do in one week. And if you have code in many different uh, source folders, what happens if you have the same package in the two folders? So, is it uh, how how do we manage the conflicts between those two ones? So, we just need to think about that. We, you can show in the brainstorm if you want. You are going to pass some time with us. So, <laughs> yes, mostly of the problem is how to show it in not a messy way. So, if you have ideas, if you have uh, thinking how to how to do it, how because there are, in this. Just in two, in two captures, you have two different scenarios that are really, really different. One, you have everything in your root folder, yeah. and one, you have a source folder. And the UI should be at least pretty good for almost all the scenarios. So it's not so easy. Yeah, so it just takes time, and we are not paid mainly to do that. So. And also, we don't know. Yeah, no, no. To see the UI, to see and use it, to see if it's working quick. We are not. Uh, yeah. No. We are not. So if somebody actually has uh, points on it, how to enhance the UI? Come on, throw stuff at us. We we want your ideas. Yes. You feel that you are good. You have ideas, or you you know I don't know. Maybe there is a you know, graphic design idea that can give you tips or things and stuff like that. Thanks a lot.